Kim Christensen, thank you so much for sitting down with us and Pleasure. to talk about leadership. Uh, and you're the man to talk about that. You are a former colonel in the Danish army. You have la, led troops in the Balkans and in Afghanistan. Uh, you have written a leadership book that was the leadership book of the year in Denmark in 2015. 2009, you were leader of the year in Denmark. Uh, you have uh, consulted several companies and currently you're working for the Danish Royal Court. Uh, let's start with uh, whether there is a difference or there is not uh, between military leadership and leading civilians. Are we looking in the right place when we're looking at the mi military leaders mm. to learn about how to... Mm. Uh, Thank you for that question. Lead civilians. Yeah. From the war zones I've been into and what I've seen uh, in corporate life and corporate world, uh, I see some, uh, some differences. And some of the differences are that when you are a military leader at war, then you know that every day could be the last day at work, basically. And therefore, we also have an atmosphere where you're working in the war zones where chaos is uh, imminent and is always a factor. And therefore, the leaders in the military systems, they have to love chaos. And therefore, I can see, uh, and just to, to challenge some of the civilian leaders, I often ask the question, do you love chaos? Because if you want to be a front runner, especially these days where things are happening so fast, so fast, you can't wait for maybe the 100% solution, because then you have been overtaken by many others. And therefore, military leaders, they are used to love chaos and also then finding out what does it take to get soldiers to follow you into basically a rain of bullet every single day. I, I would think that quite a few people today think that we're living in times that are more chaotic than they used to be. Exactly. And therefore, because of the chaos we're seeing, we're looking at the military yes. uh, leaders for advice on leadership. Uh, I see the same picture, I've seen it the last uh, basically many years and also historically based uh, you can see that military leadership is uh, sometimes giving inspiration for civilian leaders. I think what we are learning in the military, that is when you are in the war zones, that first of all you can't sit on the shoulder of your single employees or your single leaders. You have to give them freedom. and give them trustworthiness, meaning that you count on them. So for you as a leader, and that is also often discussed with civilian leaders on corporate world or public sector, you have to actually give the ambition, defining the dream, and therefore also giving a direction for them to work within and letting them free. You can't sit on their shoulders every day. And to have this relationship where you basically not see yourself as a leader, but you see yourself as a teacher, a coach, a trainer, together with your team, then I have seen so many times, then organizations, they basically explode in a very positive way. So give your employees the freedom to maneuver, then they will not disappoint you. That is actually what I can see is some of the differences between the uh, corporate world and the military. We need to let our, our leaders uh, move out by themselves for many days. And then we hope, because we have given them the direction, but also translated the wording into what is the overall intent, and what is the purpose. Because one thing is to understand the, the assignment or the task, but when chaos erupts, then you will never forget what is actually the foundation for what I'm doing right now. It is to create uh, an a situation where my colleagues, my friends, my company, they can move on. So the wording from strategy down to basic uh, organization, what to do, give them the freedom and the intention and the purpose, then they will not let you down. You touched upon this, but I'd, I'd still like to ask you, what are the, like the biggest uh, or the most frequent misconceptions that civilians have? about military leadership yeah. and military, military style of yeah. leadership? 
It's a great question, and uh, to my surprise, uh, what I what I find out is often that many people, many civilians, if we should use that wording, but could be everyone, they have an idea that being a soldier, being an officer at war, then it has to do with some shouting and yelling, being Rambo or Clint Eastwood or something like that, and that has nothing to do with reality. You will never have soldiers to follow you into the war zones if you are not taking care. Uh, often I use uh, the wording, you have to have caring compassion, caring compassion towards your soldier. If your soldiers, they do not feel that you love them and you'll take care of them and you are actually also ready often to lead from the front, then they will not follow you. And they will not follow you. But what about the relatives, the parents, the wife, the children? If they do not sense and feel that the leader, the trainer, the coach in front of the soldiers actually care about them, then they will never be followed. So actually loving your soldier is primarily the thing that gets the results. And that is often interesting to challenge the uh, corporate world uh, with the question, do you love your employees? Do you love chaos? Interesting to see and listen to the answer. But also, follow me can be a little hard in the corporate environment because we often have professional CEOs that don't have deep understanding and knowledge on what the company does. They are professional leaders. And like, how should you, if you're a professional leader and you start in a new company, uh, you know enough about the product or the service to start there, but you don't know nearly as much as your troops, as the people working for you. How do you go about start leading from the front? How can you say, follow, follow me to people who know so much more about the subject than you do? Well, first of all, normally, uh, or often I use the sentence, two steps up, two steps down. What does that mean? When you as a leader moves into an organization, you should try to get the training and the knowledge about the levels above you. We in the military, we are actually trained two levels up always because your commander could be killed. Also happened in my case, one of my commanders got killed. So his predecessor, successors, you know the system, always step up two levels. But also you have this focal point that when you enter an organization, you as a leader should devote a huge amount of time in getting down into the machine room, two levels down, to go around, to be together with your employees, to show that you have a clear interest in them, because then when time is right, and often, of course often, 90% of the time, you're not leading from the front. Mm -hmm. No, then you have your great employees or your leaders around you who do that. But when times of crisis occurs, and they always do, then it's the time for the leader to step forward and take the repercussions or give the information about why do we have to sack people today? Why do I have to shut down this factory? Why have I made that decision? Normally I say the best long-term investment a leader can, can take or can have is always to be where it is the toughest for your employees. Always. So never forget about that. When crisis occurs, you should be there. It's easy to be there when you have a fr Friday cafe and having a drink or beer or whatever. That's easy. No, no. But when crisis occurs, then it's time to step forward. So ask yourself the basic question as a leader. Do I love my employees? Do I have the sound interest? Do I love to move down two levels to learning and experience what they are really working on? And have I got the training actually also two levels up so that I can work in the spirit of my own commander or CEO or whatever it is, whoever it is. So love your employees and I'm not sure love your boss, but at least understand your boss. Oh, yeah, exactly. You have to be able to yes, get uh, shoes. We yeah. have, in, in the military system back home in Denmark, we had a system where if I had the responsibility, my first job for 30 soldiers, I was also trained equally 
to have the responsibility of 150 soldiers and 650 soldiers. 650 soldiers meaning, of course, logistics, legal stuff, uh, finance, media, everything. So when I moved move back to my own organization, 30 soldiers, I knew exactly what is the frame my commanders are working within. And therefore, I was better in conducting my job, I was better in fulfilling the task, I was better in asking the right questions, because I knew what is the frame, where are we working right now. You mentioned that it's very important to understand the task and especially the purpose. Why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, how good are companies with this? And does this have anything to do with the fact that you decided to write the book, Follow Me? Actually, I see when I have lectures or I having workshops together with uh, private uh, companies, I see that there we have a challenge. They have a challenge because we would like to have systems, KPIs, key performance indicators, where you tick in the box. There are eight areas that we have to fulfill today. Tick, 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 tick. And if we have ticked the boxes right, then we are all happy. To me, it's not the right way. You have to have the trust in your employees and therefore giving them, once again, the freedom to act as, uh, as they like, uh, as they f feel best. And to give them the freedom and the knowledge that you would be there for them is actually to train them. How often do corporate world train? That's a good question. Do you actually train? All other areas train, but do you train? So, therefore I ask the question, do you feel comfortable about not only saying, giving the orders to your organization, do this, do this, do this, and then I will control you. But do you actually say, I want you to do this with the overall intention to, or with the overall purpose of. Your employees and your leaders will never forget the overall purpose. Why? Why am I doing what I'm supposed to do? It is to create conditions for someone else to do something after me. And therefore, you give them the freedom to maneuver around and not like this, do this, do this, do this, do that. No, you give them a direction and then they can move around and then they call you three days after and say to you, Kim, I'm out here now. The purpose was, I have created the situation, but when we meet again, I love to tell you how this ended up and what I had to do in order to get to this situation. It might not always be beautiful if you want to be first mover, but you will be the first mover and then lay the bricks when you move along and then as a leader accept the fact maybe that I love three 80% solutions instead of one 100%. That creates momentum but you also have then to be courageous as a leader. So ask yourself the question as a leader, am I courageous? Am I courageous in the way that I accept the three 80% solutions and then also the mistakes? Because I think this is the right for the organization, the right thing to do. And then giving also the comfort to your leaders who knows that mistakes will be made, but he or she will always be there for me. And more than giving orders, your job is to give purpose. Correct. Communicate P purpose. Purpose-driven orders, actually. So always I want you to do this with the overall intent to. And taking that from the strategy where you have defined the big why. Why are we here? How do we make a difference in the world? And therefore the connection between the big why and down to the why do I want you to do this with the overall intent, the overall purpose to the big why. And therefore find out yourself. Why are we here? That's a tough one. And is like, again, the challenges you see bigger companies facing, were those one of the reasons for writing the book? The reason for writing the book was actually my wife. My wife telling me that when I came back from, from the Balkans in 1995, after fierce fighting down there, and uh, it was very troublesome down there, it took me all, almost three years to get back to life. So when I came back from Afghanistan and uh, lost uh, soldiers, uh, severely injured soldiers, 
soldiers with mental health problems because when you are at war, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough. We knew about that, of course. But then uh, after I was elected leader of the year in 2009, someone asked me, well, you have been working with art, sport, uh, diplomatic world, royal life, uh, corporate life, you've been to war. Write a book. And I said, never, ever am I going to write a book. And then my wife said to me, I think you should not write a book, but I think you should sit down and then write down all your ideas about good leadership and what you have experienced for your own sake. So actually she knew it would be good for me to write something down. And then after a while, it took me six years to write the book, after a while uh, it came to me, okay, it might, it could be a good idea because you also have the duty to give something back mm -hmm. to life, to your society, who have given something, to, uh, a lot to you. And therefore what I could see is basically I wanted to write the book in order for everyone to see that military leaders are not il duce leaders. Mm -hmm. It never works. But also I could see that there are many dimensions from the military leadership that could be translated into corporate world and then to give maybe uh, something back to, uh, to corporate world. Be leaders being courageous and courageous in my life is not about being physically strong. Of course you are as a soldier. But it is actually to accept the fact as a leader that we are also of flesh and blood. And therefore, for first and foremost, as a leader, be yourself. Artificial leaders are not followed. And your employees and your soldiers, they will see that in a short, it won't take long before they see or they can feel that you are artificial. Artificial leaders are not followed. Therefore, first and foremost, leaders with success and who will be followed, be yourself. That might be the starting point for many leaders. Tomorrow, I want to be myself. You mentioned that you had a really rough time, a rough three years after the Balkans. Yes. Uh, you're referring to depression or something like that? or What, 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 what came what to us when we were in the Balkans in the mid-90s, it was supposed to be a peace support operation. But on the 4th of August 1995, 3 o'clock in the morning, I received a phone call. Major Christensen, this is Colonel Softich. Take care of your soldiers. We are going to attack in two hours. And then 100,000 Croatian soldiers attacked and removed 200,000 Serbs in the area where we were positioned. I had responsibility for 150 Danish soldiers and 32 Lithuanian soldiers. So therefore, we were not trained the right way. We did not have the mandate. We were not prepared. We were not... And therefore, when things struck at that uh, pivotal moment, of course, then you had afterwards many, many things to, to reconsider. In August, September, three Danes were killed. You had above 20 severely wounded, and you have 16% with mental health problems afterwards. So you yourself as a leader had to deal with how do you cope with that uh, situation and how do you move on. So yes, of course, within the mental phase and the mental challenges you had afterwards, you had many reflections about yourself and what could you have done, uh, what did you do, what could you have done otherwise. I made big mistakes uh, when I was young, of course, uh, also when you're getting older, you make mistakes. You're not uh, God's gift to mankind. But uh, I promised basically all the relatives to the soldiers that I will ensure that all of us will come back home. To Denmark. And, you couldn't and keep of that course, promise. no. They knew I was lying. I knew myself I was lying, but it sounded good. So, therefore, I also promised myself well, the next time I'm in such a situation where it, it looks bad, that was in Afghanistan. I said to all the relatives after the strategy work, and we could see that we had to forward additional uh, coffins to kill soldiers uh, to be prepared. I said to all the relatives, I am now the highest ranking officer in the southern part of uh, the Helmand province. I take the responsibility, this is the strategy. Uh, I also have to tell you all that I do not think that all of us will come back home alive. And that was a lesson learned from the mid-90s, that you have to be... Leaders never lie. Leaders never lie. Otherwise you will be, get into trouble. So therefore, be trustworthy and tell things like it is. But going back to that three-year slump after the Balkans, um, 
did time heal you or did you learn any or tactics uh, approaches that you can still use today mm. to deal with the mistakes you've made or dis deal with maybe depression or, or d depressive experiences? It's a very complex and complicated uh, question and issue because I think uh, for each soldier, for each individual, it's something else. For me, I must say, it was very valuable to identify that some of my closest colleagues who knew about being at war, who knew about the challenges of taking the decisions and taking the repercussions afterwards and so on, they were the ones for me really to, to help me getting, uh, getting on. Starting basically with a basic question, uh, I think you should uh, give a lecture about your experiences. And uh, he knew, my colleague, what would happen. And what happened was, of course, when I had to give the first lecture, I could not do it. So I had to stop after a short while, but it was in an environment where I felt uh, comfort and safe and secure, uh, but I could not uh, fulfill this, uh, this uh, task at that time. But then we moved on. Let's talk about something very different, because currently you're working for the Royal Danish Court as the Master of Ceremonies. Yes. Uh, it sounds quite um, <laughs> exciting or uh, different, yes. but uh, that like, what is the role, how do you see the role of ceremonies in leadership? Yes. Let's not talk about necessarily a Danish court, but like ceremonies are important to people. And there are a lot of ceremonies in military leadership. What's the role of ceremonies in the current world and in modern leadership? I think uh, one could, first of all, the master of ceremonies, you could translate that into COO. Okay. So I'm taking care of the planning and the execution of all the plans that we have in the royal court with the royal family. So that is basically the task okay. of taking care of the 100 plus employees we have. So that is the task. Ceremonies are important and especially when you talk about leadership in the military but also pulling it into corporate world. Mm. Because why, then we are back to the big why, why am I doing the things I'm doing? Why am I today walking out into a minefield, maybe, once again? That has to do with something bigger and more than yourself. So you have often to feel that the core display, you have to feel that this is important for me to be a, a member of the Royal Lifeguards, 350 years old, the Danish monarchy, 1,000 years old, and have the tradition in line. Because this is something that you do then that is bigger than yourself. And this gives you also uh, pride. And who doesn't want to work a place where you are proud of working? And that is one of the thing, one of the things I often discuss, that is never underestimate the value of taking those areas into you as a leader in the corporate world. Make sure that you define your own company. Why are you here? To create a better world? clean tech, green tech, whatever subject it mm. is, but you have to have the storytelling for your employees to go to work every day with proud, with pride. This is why I'm working there. Because your grandmother will ask you the question when you're sitting together with her at a dinner party, she will ask you the question, why are you working for that and that company? And if you start by talk, talking about financial areas or whatever, doesn't make sense, doesn't interest her. She wants to know how proud are you of working that place and why are you working there? And then you should be capable and able to answer the question because we are working with children, because we are working for a better world, we are working for a cleaner environment, we are working for whatever it is. The companies who do not have a nice story to tell about themselves haven't defined the big why, why are we actually here? So that you can take also from the military. We have tattoos, we have everything around us. I do not say that, say that corporate world should walk around with tattoos over the body. Uh, that's not what I'm saying, but you, you need to be proud of where you're working, basically. And ceremonies are part of that. Yeah. Uh, lastly, uh, let's talk about something that is causing a lot of excitement at the moment and tension also, men and women. Yes. Um, is there such a thing as like masculine leadership style and feminine leadership style? 
I think that it's fair to say that uh, we are different, basically. And if you have worked in organizations, I have, where it was primarily female, I've also worked where it primarily male, and then I've worked in the mixed culture, basically, gender. You can see that when you have the mix of female, male, then it, science, is, science also shows that this is where you get the most effort. This is where you, where you can earn the best money. So that is just to put aside. How come then that we do not see many female in my own country working in the, as CEOs? In the top 25 in Denmark, we only have one female. What about the boards? Why are they, they not there? I think it's fair to say that we have to do much more to get the gender equality. I'm heading a think tank in Denmark right now where we take youngsters 18 to 25 years old in, high performance talents. We find out of 200 who want to be a part, we find the best suited 25, 13 girls and 12 boys. And to see how they work together, there you create an atmosphere of innovation, creativeness. You can see that actually this interfe interference is an interface is, is, is so valuable and it gives a, a better climate also for you to work in, in those companies. So basically I th see this as a, as a great problem right now that we actually haven't seen uh, basically, okay, it's, it's good for business, do it. Why, do, why don't they do it? Should we then fix it by orchestrating and saying we need 50-50%? Basically, I'm getting there, and I did not do that, and did not say that from the beginning, because I think it, this is also basically wrong to, to put figures into that. But because it takes such a long time, I, I think maybe it could be helpful to, to say to boards or to CEOs or organizations, we need more female into uh, your leadership or your management. Um, it, it will come. And you're actually in favor of quotas, aren't you? I, was, I wasn't initial. Okay. Initially, I wasn't because I think that actually, no, 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 this will be sorted out. This, this will be fixed. Mm. But I have to accept the fact right now, I, I see it takes too long time. So basically, maybe in, in some areas, we should say, move on, yeah. come on. Now it's the time. We want to see more female moving up because the quality is there. And the, what the way is it that we are not, if the, if the quality is there, what is it that we're not seeing then? I think that we have two conservative organizations. They are too male dominated and therefore I'm sure in a, in a generation, two or three, gen, uh, when we look forward, then we will see that solutions will be found. But uh, it's, it's also a puzzle to me. Uh, I do not have a quick fix solution to that. I'm, I'm puzzled about how come that Basically, because everyone can see that it's, it's good for money, it's good business to have the female also into the leadership areas. So it, it, all, already there, I have the problem in seeing why, why, why is this not happening? Mm -hmm. It will come with the new generations, I'm, I'm, I'm certain about that. But maybe we should push someone from the most conservative organizations or companies actually to say, come on, come on now. You can do better. Um, so basically, it's not what I wish for, but it could be that uh, one should go for it uh, anyway. Push. To sum up everything you've said, what are the three most important qualities in a good leader? In a, good le a good leader should be himself, be herself, being not an artificial leader but being herself or himself, then it is to love your employees. And finally, be ready to step up and leading from the front when crisis occurs. Kim Christensen, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Super interesting.